the world is more complicated than we can know. We can't even know our own mind most of the time. And so be really modest about what you think you know, uh, about uh, how much you think you understand the world, how much you think you understand other people. And, it doesn't, and, and be very suspicious of your own motives. We're not, none of us are as good as we think we are. You've said politics is being overtaken by tribalism. We used to have community, and community is based on uh, common affection uh, and trust. And over the last 50 years, for a bunch of reasons, we've sort of lost social capital, as they say, and we're more isolated and alone. And when people are isolated and alone, they do what the revolutionary roots tell them to do, which is they revert to tribe. And tribalism looks like community because it is a kind of bonding and belonging but it's based on mutual hatred and not mutual affection. So it's always us, them, it's friend, enemy distinctions. And if you look at polarization today, it's not that people love their own political party so much, they just hate the other one. And that's the motivator. And that's tribalism. If you looked at the Supreme Court, for example, only 2% of cases 20 years ago were decided on uh, party lines. Now it's well over 20%. And so there's just tribal, there's concrete measures of tribal distrust uh, growing. If you asked people a generation ago, do you trust the institutions of society? 70 or 80 percent said, yeah, I do. Uh, now it's 20 percent. If you asked them, do you trust your neighbors? A generation ago, 60 percent said, yeah, my neighbors are basically trustworthy. Now only 32 percent of Americans believe that. So these are measurable deteriorations in our levels of Is this deterioration a sign of the end of our civilization? I mean, all empires self-destruct yeah. eventually. <laughs> Um, you know, we go through bumpy times. Uh, if you look at 1968, it was way worse. Uh, if you look at 1932, it was worse, and 1905. And there have been times in our country where we've been in similar circumstances to, our, to today. The 1890s was very similar. We had a big economic transformation to industrialization. We had waves of immigration that was sort of troubling people. We had massive political corruption. And the country said, you know, what are we going to do about this? Let's fix this problem. And so a couple things happened. First, there was a, basically a religious revival. Um, the social gospel movement, which was very community-oriented, replaced social Darwinism, which was very individualistic. We had a surge of civic uh, revival. And so all sorts of new community organizations were formed, um, like the Boys Club, the Girl Scouts, the, tenement, the Settlement House Movement, the Environmental Movement, the NAACP. And then we had a political movement, the Progressive Era, which cleaned up government and fixed it. Uh, and so you had these three movements that basically took a very individualistic, divided, corrupt society and made it a lot better. So, you know, people are ingenious and they can work together. And I sort of think that's happening now. You said uh, Trump takes every wound and repeatedly pokes holes in it. Racial wounds. And so he pokes it at any racial prejudice and uh, racial division, uh, religious wounds, um, city versus rural, pretty much all the divisions you can think of in society, the native versus the immigrant, um, he inflames one side or another of, of these divides. Partly it's just his marketing strategy, but partly, you know, it's hard not to believe that he um, doesn't have some level of um, bigotry, uh, he just acts consistently in that way. And then finally, I think he um, just was raised in a culture of distrust that the outsiders are out to get us, that life is a, is a do or die battle. I think that's the real estate culture. It might be. I think be. that's how you do real estate at, at the multi-million dollar level. Yeah, people you, have told me that in a lot of businesses, it really is not zero sum. You, you can do a deal and both of you benefit, but in real estate, it's pretty zero sum. And so, you know, and it's either I win or you win. Uh, and that is certainly the way he thinks. And, uh, you know, I do think he, he just is so self-absorbed and so self-centered. It seems just tortured that he needs constant approval every second of every day. How do you maintain a sort of conservative bent, yet work for yeah. the New York Times? <laughs> yeah, you know, I have a worldview. When you're writing for the Times, you're writing for obviously a mostly progressive audience. 
And in that case, you just try to show respect. I mean, if you show respect um, and you allow for the value on the other side, politics is a competition between partial truths. Sure. That usually it's a trade-off between two things. Like in, it's either security or liberty, say an anti-terror policy. It's achievement or equality. There are two basic values which are intention. And politics is about finding the right balance for this moment. And so it's not, to me, it's, not, it's never one black or white. I would hate for people on my side to have total power. We'd be horrible. <laughs> and same with the other side. It, it's politics about balance. I mean, writers write, so you must have a time that you write, and you must have time that you read. You must have time when you go to movies yeah. or have fun. And my rule is the more creative the profession, the more rigorous the schedule has to be. Sure. And so I, I write basically from 8 till noon. Uh, every day and my wife knows to get out of my way before I've written I'm just not a good person after yeah. that I relax uh, so if I've got my thousand words in then I, then I relax since I was seven years old there have probably not been 200 days where I haven't either written or prepared yeah, for writing yeah. I think it was John Cheever who lived in an apartment building he would get up put on a suit take the elevator to the basement where he wrote take off the suit write in his underwear <laughs> write for four hours put on the suit ride up to his apartment <laughs> and have lunch uh, what are your thoughts about immigration? I'm wildly pro-immigration. Uh, you know, I was sort of raised by my grandfather, who was an immigrant, had a strong immigrant mentality, so I just admire the hustle of people who are immigrants. And then the evidence, I think, just objectively, is that immigrants are great for this country. They're less prone to commit crimes than natives. They're much more economically creative uh, than the rest of us. Their family values are better. Um, they're much more communal. And so I always want to write a column where I'm going to say, ah, oh, immigration's a tough issue. I'm going to look at both sides. So the, I think that would be a sophisticated column to write. But then when I look at the evidence, I don't see both sides. <laughs> I see one, the evidence overwhelmingly on one side. Um, and so that, that is where I come down. Uh-huh. And, and our racial division in this country? I, I'm somewhat optimistic about it. I think it um, it's, appears to be getting worse. Um, parts of it are objectively getting worse. We're more segregated than we were at schools and that sort of thing, or neighborhoods. But since Ferguson, there's been a period of truth-telling. Uh, a lot of African Americans saying things they wouldn't necessarily say in public or in mixed company. Uh, and that has not always been pleasant. Um, but I think it's a necessary stage to go through. And so I travel around the country with a team from the Aspen Institute, and we hold these dinners everywhere with people who are working in communities. And very often our neighborhoods, our dinners will be 40% African American or so. And um, sometimes the mood is really angry and sulfuric. Uh, and, uh, but I think that, that has to be expressed for us to move on and understand the situation of the country. Yes.